For $5 a month, you can actually see the Thin Green Line interviews and other video content on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and feel like you're part of the conversation. Join us. Hey, everybody. We are super excited to have Dr. Jason Piccolo on the Thin Green Line podcast this morning. And man, Jason, thanks for being here. It's been a really, really fast year since you and I met. And uh, we're going to talk about your podcast as well. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It has been a fast year, hasn't it? I can't even remember that when you came on. It seems like it's been a blur, like 100 episodes. Yeah, I remember uh, just settling kind of in Montana. I just recently retired and uh, you had me on your, your Protectors podcast, amazing format, in uh, season one. And I think that was all the way back in last May. And here we are barely a year later. And you just had your 150th episode of The Protectors. Congratulations, man. That is awesome. 150 episodes. Wow. And 150 <laughs> episodes I had to edit. We were talking about that good stuff in the pre interview. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I hope we make it there, John. <laughs> hey, someday. And, and Jason, I'm like Wayne and I, who, who do have a producer that helped us with all this stuff, man. You are a one man show. And I've been on a couple of your shows now. And to see the quality of the video, the quality of the audio, the visuals, the different mediums you use. Kudos to that. That's that's no easy task. I appreciate we're not, that. We're not there yet, man. We're, we're, we're learning from a pro. We're learning from a pro. I don't know but, about that. Uh, it, but it's been a great experience because I've gotten to meet so many incredible guests, yourself included, um, and learn from them. You know, Granted, I had my law enforcement background, a military background, but I'm learning every time I have a guest. So that's the greatest thing about having a podcast and a show. Yeah, it, it's really cool to see this technology available now, and and uh, especially in lieu of COVID, where these face-to-face meetings, speaking engagements, training, filming, whatever we, we would be doing outside of this, we can't do, but at least we can communicate. And uh, that's one of the topics, of course, we're going to explore today with you is how the thin green line has been affected on so many levels since COVID. But before we get ahead of ourselves, for those new listeners and viewers for our thin green line podcast, I just want to read a little bit of your bio because it is super impressive, man. And I was blown away when, when uh, we, we met last year, um, honored to know you as a friend and as, as a fellow thin green liner. So just bear with me guys. It's going to be kind of, kind of condensed, but I, I hope I don't butcher anything here, Jason. So Dr. Jason Piccolo who has been in law enforcement for over 20 years and that's several different facets of law enforcement we're going to talk about. You've patrolled trafficking corridors as a U.S. Border Patrol agent near the San Diego and Mexico border. My alma mater, home to my heart down there, doing the cartel work in California where we both uh, did some work. And you were effective in disrupting major nar- narco smuggling organizations <clears throat> before landing that, that White House Security Council's human smuggling cell. And we talk about the protectors. This is a, a, a podcast a, a little bit similar to what we're doing with the Thin Green Line in that military, law enforcement, veterans, active duty can all uh, you know chime in on some really good things going on that the public needs to know that, that you highlight. Like we said, you just had your 150th episode. Uh, you served in the United States Army from private to captain, including a tour in Iraq. And uh, how many years did you have with the Army, Jason? I had 13, five active. Wow. Wow. Good long run and uh, excellent there. And then the two books that I've had a chance to dive into since we met, and they're uh, very compelling. Everybody should read them because they affect they they deal with things in our nation that affect our nation directly and that's unwavering and then out of the shadows and if you can talk a little bit about those two books and then the content without giving away the farm um why what what prompted you to write those books and and what have you seen since that book came out as far as awareness well i you know working on the border and you know very political times later on in my career I wanted to write a book to kind of give an inside view from the ground and say, hey, you know what? This is what's going on down at the southwest border. This is the kind of crime that's going on in our country. And just that everything is not hunky-dory, that we actually have to take an in-depth view of everything going on. So I wrote my first book, Unwavering a Border Agent's Journey, is basically a memoir. It does document some of my military time, but I didn't really quite get into that as much as I got into working those drug operations and those human trafficking and smuggling operations at the border. And then I get into my time working in Washington, D.C., because we know that is a massive, um, massive uh, beast right there. And then my second book, um, Out of the Shadows, I detail the migrant children smuggling 
and trafficking that's going on at the Southwest border and how the, the country is involved with that. So it's a, uh, they're both the second book. I like to call it a nonfiction novella. It's a really short read, 80 something pages. And it kind of gives you like, here's a down and dirty of what happened with the unaccompanied alien children at the border. Yeah. And what I love about both books is you're exposing a topic that most Americans don't realize is in their backyard yep. and it's happening on this side of the border. It's not a foreign invading force, you know, um, with, with human mm-hmm. trafficking or drug production or, or anything going on. Um, and something so many people, and Wayne and I have talked about this, you and I have talked about this, and a lot of our other mutual guests, is that we have this cartel element embedded in America that's embedded in running operations like a corporate structure very effectively, right, throughout the hey. entire country. And it's just, it's, it's crazy to think that it's, it's happening, you know, right under our noses both in our rural outdoors as well as in our cities. And it's not just methamphetamine and narcotics trafficking and production or, you know, toxically tainted cannabis. It's what you alluded to in your second book, the human trafficking issue that's so mm-hmm. perva- so pervasive everywhere. Well, let's backtrack. I mean, I don't know if you guys want to kick it off right now, but hey, let's backtrack to the, the Southwest border and my time mm-hmm. as a border patrol agent. Absolutely. You know, I, I started 20, uh, 20 plus years ago and I I ended up working at the U.S. border right at the area that goes from San Diego up to the Otay Mesa Mountains. So it's a very industrial area, a lot of warehouses, and then it transgresses right up into a, a huge mountain range. And so much human traffic goes through there. Uh, and there is a lot of banditos on the border. You know that as well. But I did the Border Patrol for a while. I also detailed out to the Oregon Pipe National Park out in mm. Arizona. But the thing is, when I became a special agent with the former U.S. Customs that turns into Homeland Security later on, I went and worked narco right where literally in the same area, industrial <laughs> area, I was assigned to a DEA task force, a high-intensity drug trafficking area task force. In that same area, I worked as a Border Patrol agent. So here I am sitting in my truck at the Border Patrol, not knowing within yards of me, or tractor trailers filled with uh, whether it's weed, mota, or powder. And then later on, when I get into working the the narco contraband, I was assigned to what they call proactive groups. So we were assigned to go after the the smuggling organizations. And I found that the organizations owned so many of those warehouses exactly where I was patrolling as a border patrol agent. <laughs> so even oh, wow. as a border patrol agent, I didn't know what was going on. So how can anybody who doesn't have a, has never been to the Southwest border or has been there, uh, i.e. the news, uh, mainstream media for one to two, three minute uh, sound bites, know what's exactly going on at that border. And then later on, I worked the tunnel task force for a bit and the tunnels were massive and then all the way down to low scale ones where you had to crawl through. So there's so much at that border, man. And you know that just as well as I do. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, speaking of, you know, the methods of, of infiltration, and you mentioned, you know, you saw it overland, obviously, right on that, that San Diego, uh, mm-hmm. California border, which ironically is where I was stationed. I was stationed right on the San Diego Riverside County line in the rural side, the Temecula Basin area, um, back in 92 when I started. And we were getting it all the way up into mm-hmm. that border of, of uh, just just basically smuggling people. But we yeah. had no clue, like you said, what was going on with the narcotics and the weed trafficking. And tunnels were a foreign entity. No one thought, mm-hmm. you know, the the criminal organizations down south were being that elaborate. But talk about the tunnels that you saw way back then. How big were they? How many were you finding over a span? And uh, how 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 are you getting? How are you finding them? And, and things that you can talk about because that's that's a fascinating um, yeah, they, uh, method that people want to the- know about. Yeah. The tunnels are still going on. There, there's they right. have to. I mean, the massive amount of narcotics that it's supply and demand. And I always tell people, I'm like, every little town, every single town in our country has cocaine in it. Everyone, 320 million people. How many of those have tried or seen or been around cocaine? Not necessarily they're all taking it, but they know someone who has. Can you imagine the massive amount of supply that has to come across a border? And then you look at the seizures and a lot of people think, yeah, and you know this because uh, and I'm sure Wayne does too. DEA is a domestic entity and customs and ICE, the former customs that are now ICE and now Homeland Security Investigations does all the international investigations for narco trafficking. That's how I got involved with um, all international um, and 
DEA and FBI are supposed to go after those major organizations like the uh, the cartels, um, and you know, but everything coming across that border has to have a pathway here. Right. Lots of ports of entry. You're getting maybe 80, 100 keys per ports of entry a day, a week, maybe. So you got to figure there has to be a tunnel. I always like to think think that there's a tunnel and there's using train because good luck trying to x-ray a train coming across. Right. So these tunnels are massive. Now, they are anywhere from like, you know, the, the ones that someone crawls through for human traffic or the ones that are like really well made. They go on for hundreds of meters and they're hundred, maybe a hundred or less meters underneath the ground with power, with railway, with everything, with oxygen getting pumped in. And they're incredible. And they're there. Now, I was fortunate. I, I don't know if I should say fortunate enough. We had a collapsed tunnel, like a man-made tunnel. Uh, that was one you can crawl through. And I this is one of my funny stories about tunnels, mm-hmm. is they needed someone to, they wanted someone to cross over in on the other side of the fence and take pictures. So here I am, I leave all my guns and everything on this side of the border. And we were working with the federales. And then I ended up crawling through the border and popping out on the other side of the tunnel. And there's all these federales <laughs> with MP5s. And I'm like, hola. <laughs> so I whip out my old uh, 35 millimeter camera. And I, I gave it to one of the guys. And I'm like, photo? Necesito photo. Okay. And, it, and we started taking pictures and everything. I, to this day, I'm looking for those pictures everywhere on my things. But you go from something like that, where you're working closely with the feds over there, the federales. And, you know, they don't care about one human traffic tunnel coming across the border. But you you can't be having a massive logistical tunnel without having some sort of help on both sides of the border. So right. these tunnels are still there and it's not just San Diego, they're everywhere. Um, and that's, that's one of the main problems down there. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's crazy. You mentioned, I mean, that was way back almost 20 years ago when you were starting and seeing it down there and just right before, right around March ish, when COVID dropped, a couple more massive ones were discovered. And, you know, we were blowing that up on podcast forums and, talking about how elaborate they are and um, the rail systems you mentioned. Uh, and then it's, it's one thing to see all that getting into the country that we talk about, but what are the, what do you see as the environmental impacts? And I know that's kind of a loaded question because you and I have discussed this on your podcast, but things I started to see no. as a game more than things Wayne sees. And it's not just on the border on the South no. border, but everything Wayne sees on the East coast. I'm up on the Alberta border now closer than I was in the Me- from Canada from the Mexican cartels because of some of the attention down south. So we're getting it from both sides and we're having some environmental impacts, right, brother? That, that, uh, yeah. People and don't you know think what? I, I still keep a foothold with it. I have a ton of friends that are still in and I keep a foothold. I kind of keep an idea of what's still going on down there. And the border, when I saw it and the border, it's still the same way is just a massive dump of trash. You know, that just as well as I do is that everybody yeah. coming across the border, they don't think about packing up and it's not like you're going for a hike and you're going to pack and leave with your trash. It just, you know, you come, you leave your bags, you leave everything as you come and it's just all trash, man. And it's toxic environment. Everything, you know, from the Tijuana river, uh, overspilling, whatever comes right. out of that thing into the U S um, it's just incredible, man. And then there is no thought about the environmental impact. And, you know, man, it's just, it's sickening when you see it because like me, I grew up in the mountains. I, I live right next to the Appalachian mountains in New Jersey, nice. uh, between Jersey and PA. And I love it, man. And, you know, you and I grow up around the same time. It's like in the seventies and eighties, you have that trash everywhere. And then we, we, we start the, the ecological cleanup and it gets really good. And then me, I, I transfer from, you know, a New Jersey area, the military and stuff, end up in San Diego. And I see the mountains there are just inundated with just trash and refuse and human waste. And you're just like, Oh yeah, it's something that just, it's heartbreaking and it it's interesting. And and Wayne and I have talked uh, about this a lot together and with some other guests since COVID has been, you know, the big thing in our generation. And, you know, when we look at this pandemic on the level it's affected the country, regardless of politics and all the different theories of, of how this thing's being handled, I, I know in our lifetime, because we're all about the same age, I think this is the, the most pivotal challenge I think that I've, we've mm-hmm. all seen, um, you know, if I'm speaking appropriately for all of us. But what Wayne and I have looked at is the impacts to the outdoors with so little law enforcement presence because game wardens and park rangers and 
uh, EPA investigators and, you know, people mm-hmm. from every aspect of conservation or environmental agencies, if you will, we're tied up doing allied agency support for protests. Yep. You know, we're doing human and health safety, uh, you know, hospital escorts. We're doing all kinds of different things. And so we're just not seeing the presence of those thin green liners that are, you know, on a good year in the woods, you know, on the waterways, mm-hmm. really being the gatekeepers. And so the impacts. Well, look who's deployed to Portland right now. Portland is right. all war, war tackers. I mean, the Border it Patrol is. Tactical Response. Yeah. yeah and you yeah, know yeah. what? It's not. And everybody I talk to that's still within DHS and I'm still friends with are getting tasked with working everything but their main duties. And that includes um, the stuff that we don't want to talk about uh, that goes beyond human trafficking, comes down to like the pedophilia and the child pornography rings and everything else right. where we're taking investigators that are so keen and so attuned to investigating evil and having them do either escort duties or having them do protection duties. And you know what? They get burned out. They get burned out. They look for something else to do and maybe they leave the government. And you know, one thing about, I I try to explain to people who have never been in uniform out of uniform or took an oath is that, you know, your first couple of years, three, four years or whatever, you're, you're getting to learn what your job is. You're getting to understand what your job is. You're kind of getting good at it, but then you really get good at it. And then you leave, you know, the good ones leave. (laughs) And then (laughs) you can't just, I try to explain this to politicians and I try to explain this to everybody. You can't just hire a body. There is more to investigations and enforcement than just hiring someone who has an education or has the checks, the blocks and everything, they still have a learn. They still have to learn. And if all those good ones left, who are they going to learn from? You know, right. so you have this huge learning curve and what's going to happen really close. You just retired, right? Two years ago. Yeah. It's been about a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. It was just at the end of December of 2018. And Wayne, Two you years. were right there with me with, yep, within a couple was, of months. Yep. Wayne and I ironically retired about the same time. Yeah. If I went into border patrol when I was supposed to, when I got out of the army in 96, my, I was going to follow my best friend into it. I would be retired. Now think about yeah. this. 2001 post 9-11, all of the major hiring happened. That's when I became a special agent. Right. That's when, you know, they were still doing operation gatekeeper down at the border. So between yep. 95 and 2001, 2002 is when they hired massive amounts of border patrol agents who were all eligible for retirement if they stayed in the government. Yeah. FBI, everybody had massive post 9-11 hiring. And we're looking at about two years from now, we're going to have a massive crunch in hiring. And yeah. oh, by the way, all the hiring right now is almost to a standstill because of COVID. And yeah. it takes about a year plus to get hired into the government. So we're about to look at a major crisis here in about two years, unless we uh, <laughs> unless we change the narrative. Because who wants to be a, a, a cop or law enforcement or, or wear any type of badge right now? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I, I, I still do, but uh, it's tough to get quality candidates out of someone where everybody says defund the police, defund ICE, abolish police, abolish ICE. I mean, bro. Yeah, we're already yeah, seeing a yeah, recruitment is. issue um, among local police departments. Er, mm-hmm. Every agency has that slack right now. And have this created, we're going to have so much more slack. And, you know, our benefits have been decreased in the recent years. Uh, New Hampshire, when they went to uh, change some benefits, uh, there was going to be a massive retirement, which would have bankrupt a few cities. So they rethought it because they would rather have the trickle effect of retirement rather than what New York City is experiencing right now with last I knew a 411 percent increase in their retirement from the same time last year. So and, and what's the future? Uh, we can barely get two kids in these rural areas to take a test and, and then pass it physically you know, doing the academics and to get on these rural police departments to do a rural job and get paid little to nothing for now a 25 year retirement at age 55. And, uh, you know, where when we started, it was a little bit better, a little bit sweeter. So, and just to change the mentality. And I talked to my dad about this, like the Vietnam era, he, he, he was in Vietnam. When he came back, I said, you know, what was it like? And the, how, they treated the armed forces back then is kind of how they're treating the police today. Don't you think, Jason? It's, it's almost like a, you know, that's what I was looking back in history because I'm a big believer history repeats itself and maybe not in the same footsteps, but. You know what? 
Wayne, I'm glad you said that. History absolutely repeats itself. And I try to remind people that, you know, after Vietnam, there were so many domestic bombings. There was so much just mm-hmm. upheaval of what was going on. People forget about all the terrorist acts that were happening back then. You know, you used to have what's that, uh, Carlos the Jackal and, and all mm-hmm. his cohorts right. and everybody. Right. But yeah, it's history does repeat itself. And we don't know what part of the cycle we're in. Because if then you look back throughout all of the ages and you kind of figure before we used to be on kind of a hundred year cycle. And now you figure with technology and, and media and everything else, we're kind of moving to 10 to 20 year cycles of violence of action and everything else that's going on in our society. I'm glad you brought up the state and rural um, recruitment ideas as well, because it's tough. You know, my wife's an FBI agent and the FBI right now is having a tough time trying to find quality candidates. Really? Ooh. It's just everybody in the federal government. Because the other thing too is you have different generations and with the technology and you and I, we all know this, is that you want things a little bit quicker because you're used to having everything quicker, information on demand. And now when you're trying to hire someone who who grew up with that, and now that they're at the age where, hey, you know what? I want to get hired. I want to get hired now. I don't want to wait eight, nine, ten a year to get into an agency when I could just go get a private sector job making a hundred and a quarter a year right off the bat. Right. Yeah. And and to that point, you know, it, it's not only all the hits that, you know, this this historical repeat of the Vietnam era, you know, that that those veterans had to endure. Um, but now it's a generation of youth that don't necessarily, they're not maybe motivated to do the job for the reasons we did. I I know when Wayne and I started and when you started, Jason, I mean, we weren't really looking at the dollar signs, right? If we wanted to be, have a real lucrative income for our family, we would have went into law or medicine or engineering or something like that. It was about getting out there and just paying it forward, being moved by protecting this country and loving wildlife and loving the people and, and doing it thanklessly. It wasn't like we were going out there for accolades or any of that. We just wanted to, we wanted to serve. That was the bottom line. And we're just, I'm just finding, especially in the sentiment the country's in right now and correct me if I'm wrong on this guys, but with all the unrest and the things we're seeing on these West coast cities like Portland and the things that are being said is there's no love to serve, you know, with this particular demographic. And when you look at the fringe elements right now in technology, in social media, on the news every night, it, it's it's really given a bad kind of skew of what the sentiment of the country might be, youth or otherwise. And I think we are up for a major challenge because it's not only the retirements we're going to have, it's the just the lack of awareness or motivation for our next generations to want to do anything in service, regardless of what law enforcement branch it might be. What do you guys think on that? Absolutely. I think we're, what we're, what's going to happen is you're always going to have those ones that want to serve. And, right. I th- you know, I'm a big fan of getting away from social media sometime and just especially Twitter, because yeah. if you look <laughs> at it that way, all you're seeing is the negativity and all right. you're seeing is a canceled generation. You know, How many millions of people, I mean, how many people do you know are really focused on that? How many people just want to get up, do their job, raise their family, and just do the right thing? If we get away from social media and we get away from mainstream media, regardless of what side you're on, left or right, I think you're going to find that most people still have the same uh, moral compass. I don't know if that's the right word. Yes. Um, But then... What you're seeing whenever you turn on that news, whenever you check out your social media feed is all the negativity, right? You're always going to have people that want to serve always. You may not have the amount, um, but you're always going to have that. And that's the same. That's why recruitment, you're always going to have people going into the military. There will always be that. The thing is, you have to be able to remember that and not get to the, oh my God, the world is going to end all the time and just start trying to change the narrative. Yeah, that, that's that's really all we can do, knowing that, um, you know, middle America, quote unquote, is, is still alive and well, right? We're blessed. We're amazingly lucky to have what we have in this country. And I, I think we're we're not hearing a lot of that because, again, like, like you said, Twitter, Instagram, uh, the news stations, vi- and uh, then video John, news, whatever. I'm going to interrupt you right there because what else do you have? A lot of people are tuning into podcasts. That's why yes. you're seeing everybody starting podcasts. That's why you're seeing more people <clears throat> tune into podcasts because a lot of times you don't get ground truth unless you talk to people who are on the ground or you talk to right. people who know people on the ground or, or no, no, no. You know, you just have to find the right 
content and the right avenue for your information. Because like you said, man, you get off Route 95, you get off Route 80, 81, or one of these major uh, thoroughfares, and you get into what America is like, it's it's a very great place. Mm. People forget about that. You know, if you ever look around my office, you'll always see that I have flags everywhere because I love my flag. I love our flag. Right. The flag oh, has yeah. nothing, absolutely nothing to do with our government. It is our nation. That is what the flag is about. And I can get on my, my horse all day long and tell people about how much I, you know, I love my country. I've been serving it since I was 20 years old. That was 27 years ago. So I think I have, an, I have the right to do that. I mean, you can have a dissenting opinion. No problem. But just remember that there are a lot of people like me out there who still love our flag and still love our country. Not like the, the thousands that are, that are marching here and there across every major city. Maybe they need to take a little introspective and look at it from both sides because you know what? Destroying everything in sight uh, doesn't change any narrative. Mm. No, I mean, there's, not, there's nothing unifying about that. Sorry, go ahead, Wayne. Uh, I, I want to go to your logo, Jason, because everything you said, just I, I look at that and I look the green, the blue, the red, and that, that, that says so much to me because as game wardens, those are the people I dealt with, whether it was the fire departments for doing search and rescue, snowmobile accidents, ATVs, whether it was my local police departments that were working with me on a case or I was working on them and doing all that. So to, to see that logo behind you instantly sets the stage for me as we're doing this interview that Jason sees everything that's going on, the green, the blue, the red, and how intertwined we are and how supportive of we should be of each other. Then I go to that game warden thing where my, my friends in law enforcement will tell you we're just a little bit different. <laughs> and it's because of what our <laughs> focus are. is, is protecting wildlife. I, I took a homicide school. Here's a game warden. I was out for a year with an injury and I was in a homicide school. They let me go to every academy class. I sucked it up. I like 284 hours that year <laughs> in the academy <laughs> class. So I took homicide school and I was just thrilled to be in homicide school. And my first day, everybody introduces themselves. And I say, you know, every time a deer or a moose is killed illegally, it's a homicide. Well, all those detectives in there, I still hear this today. Yeah, Wayne, it's a homicide when a deer gets killed. You know, that they bust my chops hugely <laughs> because they're investigating people. And here I just uh -huh. said an animal, but that's my priority. And it's the same thing. We collect the same type of evidence. We do the same type of blood spatter. We collect the same kind. It, as far as I'm concerned, I'm treating that deer or moose as a homicide. But then when guys are working on those cases, like you said, trafficking and pedophilia and all these other things that are so much more important. But to me, I'd rather be out there catching the poacher. And it's just, it's different. We're wired different. And Border Patrol the crime same way. Crime. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> everybody has their niche. I don't want to, my next book is going to be on domestic trafficking, uh, nice. human trafficking, and about little kids. Like, I want to, I want to focus on our domestic issues. Mm. But that's my thing is I want to raise awareness. That's why I do the podcast. I want to raise awareness. It's something that happens, you know, um, when you don't have the power to go out and do that type of stuff, you raise awareness about it. Same, you know, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with being a game warden. I could tell you that one of the coolest things I was, a, I was down at the border. I was a 30 day detail to Ajo, Arizona. And this is before I became, I was a border patrol agent. This is before I started working dope. And I see this BLM Ranger roll up with his, his uh, Ford F-250 dually. And he's the back is loaded with uh, with bales of weed. He's got one in custody. He's got his <laughs> M4. And I'm like, that's the job I want. I just want to patrol. <laughs> I, want to, I want to hike through the mountains. I want to get the poachers. I want to get the traffickers. I just want to hike all day. And that's just one of the things, man. That was my dream when I was in a border patrol. And then later on, I got into different types of investigations. You know, when you become a special agent with uh, the former customs, you don't know what you're going to work. Mm -hmm. I ended up working narcotics and I was like, I loved working narcotics, but I tell you, man, uh, BLM, anything, uh, Bureau of land management for those out there who don't know, but if they're listening to this, they know mm -hmm. is that it's your niche, man. And it's what you're good at. And if you're good at it, you become a subject matter expert at it. And then you teach other people. So it's a kind of that ripple effect, man. And, you know, that ripple effect is everywhere. Hence, you know, if you ever look at my logo, 
the Protectors podcast is about the emergency responders, the Thin Blue Line, the LEOs, and our military community veterans and those that support them. Because you want to get those people that support them and you want that ripple effect to go out there. You want to tell their stories, hence the Thin Green Line podcast. The more stories you tell, the more people know, the more people understand, the more support you get. Mm. More support turns into more funding if that gets in the ear of the politicians or if it gets in the ear if you're running a nonprofit. That's why you'll see in my podcast, I always have nonprofits on because a lot of times they don't have an outlet to go to. Right, right. So it's all about knowledge and passing on the knowledge. I love the thin green line, man. I mean, <laughs> my thin green line is a little bit different than yours, but when it comes to conservation and poachers, believe me, evil exists regardless of what type of crime they're doing. If they're doing one crime, a lot of times they're doing another crime. So that poacher is more than likely doing something else. No doubt. We see that often on our search warrants. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> we, we we see it a lot, Jason, and and you know, and to the to your point. And your flag, like uh, it, it is beautiful from the standpoint that it's a unifying flag of enforcement. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about unity needed in this country more than ever right now versus the fringes. We're so polarized. And and that's what we've seen in the trend when we've recruited and retained less and less people, either due to retirement, like we uh, started the conversation mm-hmm. on, or, you know, just not finding the candidates that they can make the cut, so to speak. And you're, you're talking about it on the federal level with FBI. Um Sheriff's departments all over the country. I hear yeah. from brothers there, municipal police departments. And like Wayne said on the game warden front. So when you really think about all the crime, you said it best when you said evil exists everywhere. And you need game wardens in force and you need DEA agents in force and you need BLM and FBI and sheriffs and police officers knowing that we can all come together because we're going to need to come together because mm-hmm. we are a thin line regardless of color regardless. So we're going to need to be a force multiplier. And I know one of the coolest things about the last 15, 10, and then definitely the last five years of my career is seeing this change, not only with the special operations direction, some of our agencies, like my game warden agency was going towards, but seeing other agencies integrate with an acceptance level and a brotherhood level, and not just doing it because it was expected, but doing it because it was an embraced relationship and bond of trust. And we were, you know, we were taking out everything together. We were responding Mm -hmm. to homicide investigations to help map a perimeter out and go in the rural areas where we're, you know, more suited because we're there all the time. It's just, just different things like that. And it's, it's really good to see that now. And man, um, we can't have enough of that right now. You know, brother is, is what we're facing in this country. And, um, and, and the more we can recruit and retain, and it's the podcast format, like you mentioned, um, I have had as I'm sure you have and Wayne gets so many emails and Instagram direct messages since being on your show, which was one of my very first podcasts. I hadn't done a podcast under agency umbrella. I couldn't even be on social media, Yeah, you know, and then retirement comes and we can start speaking freely and meeting guys like you and, you know, the other guys we've done shows with. And you see this whole, you know, this, this big brand new world kind of branch mm-hmm. out and you realize that the SEALs and the Green Berets and the CIA SIF guys and the EPA or the DEA agents and everything else, all of us coming together in the army, we're all wired the same. We just want to protect this country. And if we're going to do it in the woods together, if we're going to do it, you know, at a demonstration that people are getting killed or whatever the case Mm -hmm. may be, we want to be because we want to destination the people in it and all the wildlife. And it's just a universal ethos. And I, I think more of that through podcasts is going to help. And I'm hoping, and it's so far so good, we are recruiting some good people that I think are going to be that that thin multicolor line of protection, you know, generations moving forward. And, you know, I, I, if anybody in your audience or anybody else, there's, there are plenty of opportunities to share the message that you have as well. I've been uh, volunteering with two veterans organizations for years now. One is Veterate, one's Higher Heroes USA. I recently went over to American Corporate Partners as well. But one thing I always talk about, and the reason they always have me uh, mentoring and uh, helping out candidates is because they want to get into federal law enforcement. There's not enough volunteers out there who know about federal law enforcement, but also about law enforcement. So make sure if you have the bandwidth, anybody out there, and you have the expertise, think about volunteering with someone one of these organizations, because you have prime candidates coming out of the military. We have 250,000 or, or so transitioning service members at any one time, at any one year or 50,000. I, I don't know. I'm not good at this. Enough. <laughs> but um, there's always opportunities, and that's where you can find great candidates. They're already in good shape. 
Uh, most of them have a clearance. If they've done anything bad, you're going to be able to tell if you take a look at their DD-214 and see what kind of discharge they have. And then maybe they could explain if they have a general or, or so. But hey, you have plenty of candidates out there and, and you have to spread the message. I found a lot of uh, people reach out to me through the podcast saying, hey, you know what? How do I get on with that job? You just had this guest on. How do I get one of those jobs? And just, you know, you got to spread the word. So if you have that expertise, I always tell people, check out these organizations out there and be a mentor. You know what? You you may not be able to find, um, you may have transitioned, retired. I this I'm just calling John out because, hey, I'm going to make him become a mentor today. <laughs> Is uh, you, uh, you recruit that new generation. Teach them. Okay, yeah, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's well said, and I think I think all all three of us are in that role right now because um, there's been a plethora of experience in federal, state, local, all facets of law enforcement. You know, I look at the three of us talking right now, and it, it, it's really like staying involved in even even I think a more relevant way by paying it forward because I think there's mm-hmm. a big challenge there now with everything we've talked about up to this point today. Um, but no, I. I'm honored. I'm flattered. And I'm more than that. That is a priority now is to when I get that message or I get a referral to help that individual with all the things I didn't know going in, you know, Mm -hmm. save them the, the, you know, the learning curve and the failing forward trip balls, because we went in kind of cold and blind. We didn't have immediate Mm -hmm. access to information. Our agencies didn't even have websites on hiring, you know, uh, requirements. We could never get a hold of a game warden on a cell phone or someone in the field. You might get a call back two weeks. Good luck. If you got a ride along, you need a, you know, a golden ticket from the governor for that. So Mm. all these different things that, that, that we talk about, um, finding the right fit and giving them everything possible. So they're, they're just, you know, got, got fire, you know, a jet stream behind them going forward. It's a real honor to be in that role. And, uh, and that's, that's the, I can't ask for anything more, you know, in retirement because I'm still involved. And, and I know Jason, we're indirectly helping, you know, my old Met team members, you know, when I talk to the teammates and they see a podcast that we've all been on, or they see that message getting out there and they're like, Mm -hmm. yes, awesome. You know, it's getting out wide. The reach is larger. We're getting more interest in game wardens. We're getting more credibility, uh, FBI agents, whatever the case may be. Um, so no, it's important that we all do that. And, uh, my concern will be when those calls or messages don't come in and then I'm going to start to worry that, you know, we're not reaching enough people or we're just losing too much interest. And, and that, that's a depressing moment. And so far so good, even through this change in the nation and all of this unrest and all this defund the police movement and, you know, everything from the the Minnesota events that just sparked a, just a firestorm in this great nation. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't stopped receiving those calls of interest. Um, and that's been reassuring and I've been kind of holding my breath to see, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen between now and November and after, and are, is, is there going to be, is it, are we going to just let history kind of calm itself again, or are we going to really see that loss? And so far so good, man, I got to say, let's hope it, let's hope it holds up. Yeah. And to well, your let's point, talk about that, that, oh, go ahead, Wayne. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say I, I was mentored. So at age 15, I was doing ride alongs right up till the day I got hired you know, working for the National <laughs> Park Service all the way across the country, I would always have a tendency to jump in with a local game warden and try to get a feel, whether it was in Wisconsin or Virginia or West Virginia. So always getting a feel and trying to, to understand, you know, because certainly different states operate different. But, you know, Sergeant Bryant, who ended up as a lieutenant, mentored me and one other individual, Mike Eastman, who's now a captain, you know, that I tried to forward that on. I don't have those success stories, unfortunately, that I have guys in place yet, but I certainly have had uh, passed on my mentorship that other active game wardens that are doing that. And I know that some of them are going to have some successes, hopefully very soon to pass on that, pass on the passion. Everything has to be grassroots now. You, you can't rely on social media and you can't rely on big brother or big sister to do it. You have to do it yourself. I mean, you have to yep. raise awareness, especially like, you know what? I love hearing, I, that's why I liked having John on, is I like to hear the stories about what it's like in our nation's forests. And every city, every, not the city, but every country side has issues right now. And I don't know about them. I mean, like I said, I always bring up the stories about work in the border and not knowing what's going on. And I didn't know how massive it was till I got to Washington, D.C. And I've been in D.C. for uh, eight years now. And, you know, I've done a lot of stuff with politics. You know, after I got out of ICE, I ended up going and meeting with a lot of congressmen and talking about trafficking 
and talking about what resources are needed at the border because I have a voice. Now we talked about, um, you know, funding and resources and everything. Nothing happens unless you get your message in front of the right people. And a lot of times the right people have to be politicians because they're the ones that are going to pass a bill or, or pass funding. And if they don't know what's going on within the country, then they're not going to support it. You know, no fault of their own, I guess, but it all comes up to who is lobbying for you if you're not lobbying for yourself. And that's why when you bring up the the ideas of like poachers and, you know, the cartels actually operating within our nation's forests, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on out there that needs awareness. You need to have guests on. You need to really hustle to get your message out there. And that's what's that's cool about this whole uh, thin green line. I like coming on here and, and spewing and talking and everything, man. It's cool. Oh, man, it's, it, it's great to break it down, you know, and, and, and reach who we can. But, you know, we started to talk about this defund the police movement and, you know, yeah. this, this, this backlash on sentiment toward law enforcement, toward, you know, just any type of government uh, regulation, if you will, from a law enforcement perspective, what, what do you see on your side of the world right now in DC and, and, and for the country? And I know it's a broad question, but just, just trends. And, and where do you see this thing well, going you know, months down the road? You know, Wayne brought up a good point. He said that he took how many hundreds of hours of training. When you defund the police, the first thing that goes is training. Mm-hmm. The second thing that goes is tertiary responsibilities. So let's say you have victim witness coordinators. Let's say you have community outreaches. Let's say you have these anti-crime squads. They're the second thing to go. So what's happening now is a lot of these organizations, a lot of these police agencies and feds and everything have to transition resources. If you take away the funding, uh, you know what New York took away a billion or 150 million from the NYPD, got rid of their anti-crime unit. Crime is up how many percent? Um, the first things that go, man. The first thing that goes are these specialized units, you know. And unfortunately, the more you take away, the more the specialized units go away, the more the specialized training goes away. So we all know, uh, you know, the predecessors to the SOG teams and everybody else, the, the original SWAT teams grew out of hostage situations, grew out of riots, grew out of this, grew out of that. But if we keep defunding and defunding and defunding, we're not going to have specialized units. We're just going to keep going back in history. Uh, so it's 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 going to be some really tough, lean times trying to get the same things done. You know, if if your homicide detectives or your narco detectives or your gang detectives are out working patrol or riots, nobody's investigating that crime, those crimes. Right, right. But how long before the population reacts, do you think, Jason? Because I, I see what's going on, but I wonder, silent majority, I will call them, how long will, the, will they stand for that? Because I know in the rural silent. America, that's they like law and order. We, we like to, to have our normalness. And I'm sure the people that live in these places that are upside down like to have their normalness too. Well, you know, how many people are fleeing New York now? How many people are fleeing mm. these big cities? Unfortunately, they're going to take their same um, way of thought to these rural areas and suburban oh, areas. You said it. <laughs> yep. and that's, Houses that's are going like issue. crazy around here. And yeah. that's uh, what my fear yeah. is, is they bring just what you said, their thoughts and their beliefs to rural life instead of adopting the reason you came here. Yeah. <laughs> The, the reason you should be going there is you want a peaceful life where everybody gets along and you mm-hmm. guys can thrive. <laughs> Uh, your kids can thrive. My biggest fear is my kids. You know, I have a 10 and 12 year old and I'm like, I don't, my, all my actions are what is going to affect them. Mm. And when does this, I live outside of DC. I'm like, when does it spill out to here? I know when, you know, the riots first started, my wife got called up and every FBI agent in the, uh, the Washington field office got called up and they had to go and patrol the streets of, of Washington, DC. What kind of training do those FBI agents have in riot control? The last riot control training I had was in a border patrol, and I think it was literally four or eight hours, and that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. FBI, I guarantee it doesn't have any riot training, nor do they have the gear. You know, It's not like they handed out ballistic uh, helmets to them. I mean, you could throw on a bulletproof vest. We all know that bulletproof vests don't stop knives. They don't uh, stop edged weapons. A bulletproof vest, and if what are you going to get a twenty-one inch baton to stop anything? 
When was the last right. time you qualified with a baton? When, when was the last time you were proficient with a baton? You know, these are little things that turn into big things mm. when you deploy thousands of federal agents to go around. We have to start thinking about the bigger picture. So when you defund everybody, you defund that training, are they ever going to get riot training? Are they ever going to get uh, protest training? Are they ever going to get just any type of training when it comes to that type of stuff? But because maybe there's some sort of like magic bullet training out there where it teaches you how to deal with people, um, you know, the verbal judos and all <laughs> the other types of trainings they used to have. Maybe there's something else out there. It doesn't have to have to do with uh, violence on violence. But I don't know, man. It's just I don't want it to spill over into my neighborhood. Mm. Uh, but I have that luxury of not living within a city. Mm. Not everybody does. You know, there are people that have to live in cities. There are people that have to live where these riots are going on, where this violence is happening, where their businesses are. And the businesses are getting shuttered with COVID. Now they're getting shuttered forever because they've been burned down or looted. Right. Right. So when does it bleed over into the into the silent majority soon? Um, definitely pre and post election, regardless of who gets elected. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to be going through some tough times, I, you know, for the near to midterm future. We'll get over it. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, the other uh, I'll stop talking here in a minute. But the thing is, we got attacked on 9-11 almost 20 years ago. Uh, Boston bombing. Yeah, that was that was that was a horrific event. But we mm -hmm. haven't had a major terror event since 9-11, like major. Right. You know, we've had people drive the trucks through crowds, um, terrorists. I'm not talking about the protesting ones. But what happens when a major terrorist attack happens, whether it's from a, dom a domestic player or an international player or maybe an international player funding a domestic player? happens in one of these big events and we start going into terrorism mode again um there's a lot of lot of activity that can happen you know and i'm surprised it hasn't happened yet when you have these thousands of thousands of crowds it doesn't take much to cause havoc i mean look at las vegas that was a uh mm -hmm. the las vegas shooter literally shot a concert with thousands of people now you have tens of thousands of people in one location that have already funneled themselves off and uh, I don't know, man, not, not to get on my terrorist bandwidth, but that's what my doctorate's in. And I always like to kind of throw that out there that we need to keep our eyes on the on the uh, on the whole picture. Well, we, we absolutely do, man. And it it's disheartening to see what short term memories we have from the effects of 9-11 mm -hmm. and how especially other parts of the country, not near New York, not near on your guys side of the world, but out in the West where I'm from. Um, just how quickly we forgot and got yeah. complacent and got comfortable and, and took what we have for granted. And to your point, Jason, this is a powder keg right now. I mean, law enforcement is so dispersed. They're so exhausted. They're so demoralized. Um, some are quitting and retiring early because of the liability issues, the stress of everything we're seeing with this anti, you know, law enforcement defund movement. And it's a powder keg with all these crowds gathering and continue to gather larger and larger and larger as they go unchecked. So I think it's a matter of not if, but when, and that's, what's going to be a real shaker, especially of how that's going to affect our country since nine 11. I mean, one, if you look at one positive from the whole nine 11 incident was we banded together as a country. I mean, it seemed like the left and the right were so unified just for the sake of this nation, staying together and keep and staying safe. Um, at least in its initial few years, it was really inspiring to see how we bounced back. Um, I don't know how we'd bounce back right now, you know, given the sentiment of the divisiveness right now, especially for the next several months and maybe longer, if we did have a big terrorist attack or plural in these big crowds and how that would affect the narrative at these protests. So it's something the country needs to be aware of and and um, and be thinking about uh, from a, from a long term standpoint, for sure. We need to find some positivity in this conversation, man, because yeah. it's it's tough to think about because uh, you wonder what is the next step for our country. And it's like a slow burn right now, a very slow burn. It may seem like the whole world is on fire, but it's it's central in, in these major cities, in these major right. areas. It's going to start bleeding over. Um, and then I'd hate to see, you know, brother against brother or whatever based on their ideology. Um 
But like I said, man, you have to have civil discourse and you have to find the right people to be able to spread that. And I don't know how we're going to do that right now with such di- divisiveness. Um, November is going to be an interesting time. Um, and we're definitely going to see major activity before and after it, I'm sure. Yeah. And I think, I think to the point of a positive message, the bottom line is we're all Americans, you know, left, right, middle, color, race, none, none of it's an issue. We're, we're, we're human beings and we're Americans. And I certainly promote that with my friends, my family, my community, law enforcement. And, and, and yeah, I'm way out of the fringes of the drama now, having left California and being in, you know, Montana and, and there's community and we don't have protests and everybody's got each other's backs. But what if that fringe does bleed over? That's certainly a concern. But in that same statement, there's a divisiveness just in what if it bleeds over? Because it's that sentiment that we're all worried about in these small towns like Wayne and I are in. And you're, you know, on the fringes outside of the, the D.C., you know, hub of it all. We got to unify. You know, I, uh, it, it's one of the biggest things that we talk about on all of our podcasts, regardless of, of which one we're on or who we're having as guests. And we have to find that middle ground. And this, this, the social media and the mass media is playing to the fringes. This is not all of America. Uh, these protests, this sentiment, the violence, brother on brother, we're seeing. Um, and we need to remember that and and not get completely paranoid in the other realm where we just all give up and isolate with that civil discourse. Because I agree with you, civil discourse is necessary. There are major issues in this nation that need to be fixed. We can't turn a blind eye. We can't placate those issues, but we need to do it together. And that that's a very general statement, I know, but it's really the only solution I see that's going to work. Otherwise, we're just going to implode. And I got to go positive too, Jason. I mean, what we're seeing a huge influx into the outdoors. People are reconnecting yes. mm-hmm. to nature, to the outdoors, to to what God gave us. It's it's just it's a really cool thing. It's just I, I get excited about it because here people are fleeing the cities and they're coming back to their basics. You know, our fishing licenses are, are up nationwide. Yeah. Hunting, people are wanting to know more about the outdoors, survival, um, all things that are basic to us. But these people are coming and I think it's awesome that they're reconnecting, that they're taking their time to go on a hike. They're seeing these views and you know it's a healing force if you ask me when i go out there and spend some time in the woods and john knows it too because every time i see him in these awesome pictures i'm like yeah yeah i'm Uh jealous (laughs) but it's a healing force uh, and it's awesome well you know it's the truth well you know homeschooling the kids for the past few months we take field trips i take the afternoon Mm. off we go field trips Uh, we go hiking and the other thing too is fishing i took kids fishing we got a rowboat with a little Putt putt motor, La, yeah, yeah, fishing, and that's the thing is like I got my rucksack on. You know, I haven't got my rucksack on in years. <laughs> I started rucking. Yeah, I'm like you were rucking, <laughs> rucking. And John knows he's watching my face. So it's like these things, like getting back to like I miss growing up by yeah. like, the mountains, man. I was yeah. literally like two miles away from the Appalachian Trail. I could just cut across my neighbor's lawns and just go up on top of there. And you know what, man. That's what we need to get back to. We need yeah. to get back to nature. And you know, I just bought the um, I bought the roof racks for the Jeep. We're gonna get the little nice. thing for a a, uh, a kayak, so we'll get some kayak soon once they go on sale. Because everybody's buying out kayaks, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah, they're, they're done. <laughs> you can't. Good luck finding a kayak, right? You know, between web trying to buy a webcam and a kayak, everybody's uh, priorities right now. Yeah, you know, no trying doubt. to get online. But yeah. getting out to nature, man, it's perfect. This that's one thing that always seems to bring people together. Is like once they get out there and go get some fresh air, and they're like, "Wow." Mm. Yep, and it, it makes everything else feel small when you get out there mm-hmm. and you see the masses. You see that comet coming. You know, nothing made me feel smaller than watching that comet and looking up yep. at those stars. Yeah, and mm-hmm. just feeling that's, like you know, I'm I lived a in a very small part of it. <laughs> Uh, my wife was an officer basic course in the nineties, late nineties, 99. And we, um, we lived in Arizona for a bit, like six, seven months. And I loved it, man. It was such clear nights out there and just mm, yeah, I missed yeah. the desert too, man. I love it. You could look up, you can see like the shooting stars, the comets and it's just, wow, man. Yeah. And a lot of these veterans groups, Jason, bring veterans and bring them to the outdoors. I know yeah, I have the 45th absolutely. parallel wounded warriors near me. And those guys mm-hmm. have a place to wounded warriors come up. They, they hunt, they fish, they, they experience the outdoors. They get a camp to stay at. It, it, it's, 
again, it's that healing process. And I know you work with a lot of veterans groups and I just, I see that and I, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty excited to acknowledge the healing force of the outdoors too. Cause I, that's, that's definitely a pretty cool thing. So. Yeah. I work with um, operation supply drops. Actually now it's a uh, outperform serve and develop and they have, uh, I think it's called vets gone wild where they do like hunting trips and everything. So it's pretty cool, man. Yeah. OSD.org. We are OSD.org. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's uh there's so many things out there for the veteran community and now LEO community as well, because they need a stress reliever. Right. So there's a lot of different things, and for you know the concerns of police survivor does a lot of stuff for the uh, the fallen officers kids mm-hmm. that have to Absolutely. do with the outdoors. So there's a lot of awesome organizations out there that are nonprofits that mm-hmm. very please check them out. Yeah, and it's great you're bringing your kids and taking the time and going fishing, going hiking. That's the other thing I'm seeing is these family groups doing that type of thing that normally, mm-hmm. you know, the hustle and bustle of life, it, sometimes we, we set that on the back. And I know I've spent more time with my son than we would ever normally. We would have been traveling, doing this and doing that. We still spend time, but the fishing, uh, the hiking, the just the, the, the hanging out with him and his buddies and just always being there and making mm-hmm. those memories that are going to last his lifetime. Is, is uh, I'm pretty excited to do that. So, and it sounds like you are too. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's all about. So that was a good way to leave it on the positive. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It come, comes back to that thin green line of outdoors, man. Uh, Wildlife, wildlands and waterways guys. Um, it's hard to hate when you're up in nature. It uh, really is true. <laughs> and bring a good knife, the John Norris knife. Exactly. Oh, geez. <laughs> might know a guy. Yeah. There might be a blade in the in the knife world. Yeah, no. So, Jason, um, you're doing so many good programs and and potential sponsors and things like that. Is before we wrap, is there anybody you want to talk about or programs you want to make our listeners aware of and, and us aware of if we're not already there? Um, really support the podcast, sub- subscribe to it. It's gone beyond a podcast. I started calling it a show because we are now the protectors of streaming on Vimeo and Amazon fire TV, averaging like something like 30,000 views now, um, per show. And it's just incredible, man. Um, it's awesome. podcast is streaming everywhere. The protectors, I have a women's empowered series as well. It's called that. empowered with Kelsey and Jason. And that we talk to women LEOs, women veterans, and just try to bring, you know, get really good stories out there because I have a 10 year old daughter and I really want to learn from empowered women. So check out empowered. Mm. The other thing is I'm wearing notch gear. I love notch gear. They don't sponsor me, but I I just really dig their gear. Uh, Combat flags, uh, check out combat flags, use code protectors. Um, They sponsor the show now, which is my first sponsor. So uh, yeah, man, if you ever look at my office, you'll see I have flags everywhere. So, uh, awesome. and a lot of them are combat flags and that's it, man. Um, OSD, we are OSD outperform, serve and develop. I am their director of corporate philanthropy. Uh, but I've been slacking on that, raising money for the organization, but they do a lot of great stuff, uh, for the veteran ecosphere, they call it ecosystem. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's probably a million other th- shout outs I could throw, but that's, that's it for now, man. Good stuff, man. Well, we'll, uh, we're going to promote those and, uh, just thanks for being on the show and everything you bring to it and, and sharing such a great conversation on current issues and, and uh, longstanding ones. And we'll, we'll certainly keep on touch and bring you back for some more updates. Thanks guys. Yes. I do want to leave off with one thing about the thin red line, thin green line and thin blue line. That is not a standoffish line. That right. is really the line that really keeps evil away from you. It's only a thin line. So they're there, the protectors, and that's why the protectors community is uh, very near and dear to my heart. Thank you, guys. Well said. Thank you, buddy. Thank you.